My name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. We are here aboard the Columbia 2, my Mark III space shuttle. Obviously, we have just taken off. Look out the window. You are looking through the eyes, by the way, of Burak Kerman, one of my two pilots on the surface of Kerbin. And to his right here is my newest Kerbinot, Genli Kerman. Engineer I just hired. Looks like his textures are a bit mixed up. I think he's got a female texture. I'll have to make sure to fix that for the next mission. We are, of course, looking at this through the interior view. Enjoying this wonderful interior with all those screens coming at us from raster prop monitor. Got a screen there actually in the middle that's keeping an eye on our payload. Talk about that in a little bit. But meanwhile, why don't we talk about what's coming up in this episode? I think we got quite a lot coming at you in this episode. We have, uh, well, there's going to be actually another Columbia 2 mission. There'll be a second one. We'll reprep the ship and get it out again, doing another mission. We got our two Koryans, my Kerbin system runabouts. The Koryan 1 is coming back home to Kerbin Station, and the Koryan 3, it's on its way to Asteroid Yoy, which is in orbit about the moon. And we'll be visiting both of those two vessels. We also, because I got to do some crew rotation, got to get some Kerbals up and down from Kerbin Station. So we'll be using the Otter X1, my SSTO, my space plane, single stage to orbit space plane, to accomplish that. But in the meantime, as we finish off our circularization burn with this vessel, why don't we talk a little bit about what this mission is? Okay, there goes our main booster. And we'll just translate up a bit using RCS. I do have a couple of screens pointing down on the fuselage. So the booster is, you can see the booster there. It's kind of hard to see because I think it's just a little bit too close. Why don't we open up the cargo bay doors in the meantime? Now you can start to see the booster drifting away. Uh, I can't see the cargo very well, so why don't we get out of cockpit view here and take a look at this. It's, as you can see, not very big, but there is a second part to this mission. And the reason why I did need to bring this up using the Columbia. Well, why don't we concentrate on the cargo? So this is MAPSAT-9. MAPSAT-9 is almost identical to a vessel MAPSAT. Oh, that tank is only about a quarter full. I can't remember sometime okay, I can't remember if it was a quarter full to start with or not, but why don't we play it safe? We got lots of fuel in the Columbia. Why don't we transfer out the fuel? As I was saying, MapSat 9 is a sister craft to MapSat 8. It is almost identical except for this Oscar B that I added because it needed a little bit more fuel to get a capture around the moon than it does take get a capture around Minmus, and it's just gonna do a high altimetry scan around the moon. Anyway, now with it on its way, just kind of back down here a little bit to we'll clear it. Why don't we get into the second half of this mission? I do have some debris that I need to recover. A mission to recover unit H32NCB. So the second part of this is to rendezvous with that in low curb and orbit and then to uh, bring it back down to the surface. I'm not entirely sure what this is, but I thought going big might not be a bad idea. I did botch this ascent a little bit, so it's gonna take a little while for the uh, Columbia to get to our target, but that's okay. It's got, again, lots of fuel, lots of life support, but that will give us some time to send MAPSAT-9 on its way. It was very clear that actually I had originally had only a quarter of a tank on that Oscar B because this thing now has 1,800 meters per second, which is way more than it needs of Delta V. And its thrust to weight ratio is now only 0.18. So it took almost seven minutes to perform this burn to do a Mooner injection. So maybe transferring that fuel wasn't such a good idea. But either way, the injection went just fine. 
We'll have to do a mid-course correction burn to get it into, I want to get it into a polar orbit, of course. But in the meantime, why don't we cut to our rendezvous with unit H32NCB. As mentioned, I'm not quite sure what this is, but I'm starting to think it's smaller than what I was sort of planning for. Let's spin this around. No, I can see now that it is a homegrown rockets capsule. It's like that, yeah, the onion, the two-person onion capsule. Okay, so it'll fit in here easily, and unfortunately it is tumbling. <laughs> Let's speed up the playback on this thing so this whole process doesn't take too long. I do have persistent rotation installed, so that's why it is tumbling. And it's also why time warping won't stop it from tumbling. So the plan here is just to see if I can catch it. <laughs> if I can just kind of maneuver in there, catch it, hopefully uh, that will stop it from bouncing around too much. You'll also find out why I have an engineer along because I'm going to have to dock with it, which means I'm going to have to take a docking port and install it onto this capsule. So Gene Lee's going to have to go out and do that. I suppose one of the options would have been to put the claw on there, and I know that's part of the purpose of why the claw exists. Maybe I should start using the claw more often. It would definitely be easier. It's just, I always see that claw, it's so... Oh, I don't It just doesn't look like a very kind way to join things together. It doesn't look like something that would grab something without doing damage to it. But you know, this seems to be working all right. I'll just sort of match velocity with it. I think that's pretty good. Let's get out Gene Lee. And see if he can not move a docking port over there. Okay, we've got ourselves a live load. <laughs> Watch your fingers, Gene Lee. You don't want anything to get pinched or crushed. Well, not just your fingers, I suppose your entire body. This would definitely be something you wouldn't get a real astronaut <laughs> to do. Okay, we got his screwdriver. Equip that. And I'm just going to take this docking port here and shuffle it over there. In fact, it is, yeah, this is positioned pretty well. Whoops, I just detached it by mistake rather than moved it. Uh, let's turn the camera here and Gene Lee's floating away. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Come on. Get in there and attach. That's it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The magnetic forces there just gave it a bit of a kick. Okay, let's back Gene Lee away until this thing decides what it's going to do. Oh my goodness. Well, maybe I should try getting Gene Lee in there. Maybe he can sort of orient it the right way. Okay, it's stopped, but now the docking port's pointed the wrong way. That's not good. Get in. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like maybe he can just use a little bit of the reaction wheels built into this capsule. Well, then again, maybe you can just sort of nudge it. Let's nudge it over that way. Nope. Okay, just nudge it back down into the cargo bay just a little bit. There we go. Yep, okay. Get to the hatch. And get in. Oh, and of course, it's got no life support. It has no electricity. I can't do much of anything. In fact, I don't even think this capsule has reaction wheels. Oh, this is useless. Oh, and now I think Gene Lee has no life support. Nope. <laughs> he went in with life support. This thing is obviously a resource vacuum. It just sucked it all up. Well, he still has EVA propellant. So let's get him back into the capsule. Or back into the uh, cockpit here. Get him safe. You got the docking port on, so that was one thing. And to be honest, it's kind of maneuvered itself kind of almost where I need it. Okay, let's target from here. and Or control from there and target this docking port. 
and bring up the docking alignment indicator here. But to be honest, I think it's in a pretty good spot. What I'm hoping I can do is just sort of turn. Here, let's, let's focus the camera down here so I can really see what's going on. I just want to turn the shuttle and see if I can just get those docking ports to line up enough for the magnetic forces to, to take hold. Oh, 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 we got some serious rubbing action going on here. Oh, come on, you're going to want to connect together. And that's it. We've got it. Ah, huh, that went all right. <laughs> Let's uh, close our docking bay doors. We'll take a look at our contract here. No, that's not the right one. Let's go uh, over to here where they all are. There it is there. Okay, I'll put that over to the other view, open it up. Yep, so we got the recover part of the contract done. Now we just need to get it down to the surface. Don't need this rendezvous thing anymore, nor the docking alignment indicator. So uh, let's start thinking about our descent. So we'll go over here to map view. And oh, yeah, I'm coming over the Kerbal Space Center. How am I doing on alarm clock with MapSat 9? MapSat 9 is coming up to its burn. I'm going to need to get around to the other side of the planet before I can do the descent. So let's get out to MapSat 9, where we need to do a correction burn to get us into the proper orbit. Now, last episode, I talked a little bit about um, what is the cheaper way to do these kinds of insertions, whether to go in nice and close to the planet or the body, in this case, the moon, and take advantage of the Oberth effect or whether it is to be far out. And I said for Minmus, it's easy, it's better to get in close and take advantage of the Oberth effect. Turned out for the moon, if your altitude is less than 1,350 kilometers, the altitude of the orbit you want to insert in, it's better to just do a direct insertion. Set your periapsis at the altitude that you want your orbit to be. So in this case, I'm setting my periapsis up to 750 kilometers though to be honest uh probably this burn is probably more than offsetting the amount that i'm saving doing it this way but oh well uh probably doesn't make much of a difference one way or another we are talking about negligible differences anyway with that done we'll be there in less than a day so let's get back to the columbia and do our descent so you can see I'm using trajectories again, and last time I went long, so this time I'm going to put the red cross a little bit ahead of the Kerbal Space Center. Again, my goal, of course, is being on the runway. And, well, once again, I failed miserably. <laughs> You're blowing right over the Kerbal Space Center here. And, uh, yeah, I'll end up having to ditch it into the water, which, I mean, does work fine. I... I don't know. Uh, what I really probably should be doing is just practicing this more. Problem is, I don't know if I care enough to really spend that much time practicing. So, ah, well, it is what it is. And as you can see here, the contract is now complete. So now, let's time warp ahead a little bit further on to the next day. And go into our next launch. This is the Kuryu's, and aboard we have, well, Burak and Jean Lee once again. And if you take a look down there, you can see that I now have an appropriate chat texture for Jean Lee. I don't know why I did Burak again. I really should have rotated and put Stala in there. And in fact, I don't even need an engineer. I don't need to have Jean Lee, but I thought I'll put Jean Lee up again for no real apparent reason. <laughs> And uh, this is actually a redo of a mission that I had to cut short last episode. Um, the Kuryus is in going into a polar orbit to collect mostly gravity science from both low and high orbit and try to hit all the various biomes that I haven't gotten to yet. And uh, last episode I had to cut that mission short because the solar panels broke off during firing separation. This time I've replaced those solar panels with these more, less likely to break solar panels that I don't think look as good, but functionally actually are better. So we'll stick with them. 
One of the main biomes I'm missing here are the Badlands. It worked out all right. I was able to grab the near space Badlands in just my second orbit, so that worked out fairly well. And then it was time to burn into high altitude and circularize up there at above 250 kilometers and get the biomes that I was missing up there. In fact, I just needed to do a little bit of a normal adjustment here to ensure that I do get the Badlands on this particular pass. Curious once again is a very versatile vehicle. Days and days, dozens of days of life support. Lots of uh, Delta V. And then after getting those Badlands, I did try to get uh, some of the more sort of piddly sciences, kind of get as much. I mean, there was like sort of one, 1 1.6 sciences still left in these biomes that I've done before. But after getting the last of those, it was time to start to descent. And overall, I was pretty pleased with all this. I mean, uh, the whole mission took actually less than three hours. I was able to go over all the biomes, both in low and in high altitude. Overall, a pretty worthwhile mission. But with this done, it was time to jump ahead a few days and visit the Korion 1 getting ready for its first arrow breaking pass on its way back from Minmus. This is my first arrow breaking with air brakes installed on my spacecraft. I've used air brakes quite a bit, but they've always been on aircrafts, not on spacecrafts. So let's we'll see how this goes. And when I first installed these several episodes ago, somebody told me in the comments that they were on backwards. Frankly, actually, if you look at most aircrafts, they are on the way I have them this way because it's mechanically unsound the other way around. They'll have a tendency to shear off. And actually, drag-wise, they work both ways. Both They work equally well both ways. I actually did some experiments to verify that. So it doesn't matter how you put them on. Put them on the way you'd like to put them on. Whoa! Oh! Then again, <laughs> the whole, that whole conversation might now be mute because they are gone. Wow, I had no idea they were that fragile. They broke off really easily. I don't think they did much of anything to slow me down. So, well, so much for that idea. <laughs> anyway, the arrow breaking went fine after this. And clearly, the Karayan 1 and her crew are going to be getting to Kerbin Station fairly soon. And I do want to get Jeb down to the surface because he is ready to level up to level 3. So that means I'm going to need a new pilot at Kerbin Station. So, let's get that crew rotation on the way. This is the Otter X-1, my single stage to orbit space plane. And it's got Kerbin Station targeted because that is where it's going. And this is the second time you've seen this vehicle. I spent quite a bit of time talking about it in the previous episode, so I don't think I'll spend too much time talking about it here and showing much of this ascent. Especially considering that it's dark, so it's not exactly the greatest of video, but I will point out that aboard we have Starla! Because she is going to be our next pilot. And along for the ride, once again, is genially... <laughs> I don't know. Didn't, I don't. I don't like putting Kerbals in single missions if I can help it. So I thought I would send Genie along just just for the ride. He's going to be coming back down. One sort of interesting thing that kind of did happening. Interesting, a relative word. Somehow I gave this thing a full load of monoprop. It doesn't need anywhere near the amount of monoprop. I usually leave about half the monoprop tanks empty. Um. And that meant it was actually fairly costly getting up into space. And by the time I achieved a low orbit, I only had 50 meters per second of delta V left. But actually, that turned out to be okay because that was enough for me to get it to Kerbin Station, you know, with a little bit of help from the ample amounts of monopropellant that I had aboard. And then at Kerbin Station, it can fill up. Actually, what it really needed was a little bit more oxidizer, of which Kerbin Station has plenty to be able to do its descent. So. It was not a big deal. And you can see on the docking alignment indicator, I have the ventral berth as my target. That is the newly installed extended docking port for large space planes like this. But as I was getting closer, all of a sudden I said, wait a second, I bet you it would look really nice on that bottom port there. That's the aft berth. So I switched to my target and put on the brakes. <laughs> 
and started sliding over sideways to get it in underneath here. That looks like a nice place for it as well. It's nice having suddenly ample docking options <laughs> on my station. Anyway, once this thing is docked, it's just going to hang out here. It's, its job now is just to sort of hang out. It's got a few supplies tucked away in a storage locker on top there, but for the most part, it's just going to hang out here, wait for the Korion one to show up. And there we go. All right. You do have some reaction wheels tucked in here. Make sure those are off. There we are. <laughs> I think it looks pretty good. Let's uh, skip on to the next day. We're actually the Columbia 2 was ready for its next launch. And piloting the Columbia 2, in fact, the only crew at all is the only crew I had available, is Burrick. I just mentioned how I don't like sending people up on their own. Uh, I guess maybe this wasn't a boil either. Either Burrick was going to go on his own, or Stala was going to go on his own. I, just, I guess I just didn't put enough thought into it. But, oh well. I'm sure Burke is up for the job. So we'll just cut up here after main engine cut off and get into our circularization. The mission is to fulfill a contract to recover 400 units of ore from the surface of Minmus. So what we have here for our payload is a Minmus miner that's what i called it or a minimus driller i think that is what i called it actually um and its job actually is not to do any refining just to get the ore and in fact all it's got to do is get that ore off of the surface and get into orbit around minmus let's get ready to deploy our payload and get ourselves a better look at it so we'll orient the vessel more south like this, open up the cargo bay doors. And uh, I guess I gotta come out of this, uh, <laughs> get back into normal view here. There it is, there is my, my Minmus driller. Oh, let's uh, get this antenna down. You can see it does fit in here nice and snugly. Yep, the reaction wheels are on. So I think I am ready. Yeah, let's control from there. Oh, it's spinning now. Don't spin, don't spin, don't spin. <laughs> I went to control from the uh, the probe here, but of course that docking port is the other, or the probe body is the other way around. Okay, now I'm ready to, let's get this under some control. Okay, deploy, there we go. And then we'll back down the Columbia here. And take a little bit. Oh my goodness, the drills are deployed. <laughs> I must have had them. Uh, I think I have them on the same action group as what opens up the cargo bay doors. That wasn't very well done on me. So here's the whole thing. We'll take a uh, closer look at it when it goes to perform its mission out by Minmus. That's not going to be happening this episode. Right now, we do have to descend the Columbia. And uh, a little bit trickier this time because uh, I am in a, a six degree inclined orbit to match Minmus's orbit to make the transfer out to Minmus a little bit cheaper. And that meant a little bit of uh, trying to guide the Columbia towards the landing site. And actually I did a pretty good job of steering my trajectory towards the landing site, but once again I well overshot. Coming in this way, though, did get me thinking that maybe I should try and do this more like what the real space shuttle did, which wasn't so much about pitching up, but pitching from side to side, doing these banks to slow itself down. So I think I'm generating just too much lift. Of course, doing that gets you falling faster, which means heating will be more of an issue. I don't know. Like I said, I think I just need to practice more. But anyway, uh, this guy splashed down again into the ocean to the east of the KSC. But you know, it was right after this I started to think. At the beginning of this episode, we sent MapSat 9 out on its way to the moon. That was quite some time ago. Should have gotten there a long time ago. 
but I don't remember doing any kind of orbital insertion. Let's just check the probes that are around here. No, no, that's not it. None of these satellites here are map sat nine. So, oh, oh, oh dear. There it is. That's it. In a crazy high inclined orbit around Kerbin. Oh, let's switch out to it, but I think you know what happened. Uh, I must have forgotten to set an alarm for when it entered into the moon's sphere of influence, so it obviously got some sort of kick from the uh, moon's gravitational field and now is in this crazy orbit. Oh, man, i got to get this back to the moon. And it looks like I'm going to be lucky here. You can see it's actually kind of glitching out in a moon encounter as it is and in fact an immediate 90 meter per second adjustment got it back on a trajectory that I needed encountering the moon in just a day and don't forget this thing has way too way more fuel than it needs so doing these adjustments are going to be fine that's crazy lucky I mean this thing could have gotten to an orbit that crashed into Kerbin or ejected it out of the Kerbin system altogether but uh, instead I'm going to be able to get it back to the moon and try this again in a little bit. And speaking of getting to the moon, well, the Grand 3 has now just entered into the moon's sphere of influence. This has been a 15-day mission for it so far. It hasn't even gotten to what it's supposed to be doing. It's done a fly by the moon. It's gone out and visited Minmin Station. We've swapped scientists, and now we're on our way back. And so finally, we can start thinking about getting these people doing the mission that I originally had planned. And uh, what the plan is, is to get to asteroid Yoy. And uh, that's going to happen, I think, fairly quickly in the next episode. You'll be seeing it there. And don't forget as well, last episode I parked my asteroid miner. This is an integral part of this mission around asteroid Yoy. I parked it in this orbit last episode. Uh, now what I need to do is get it over towards the asteroid. I'm just doing this rendezvous burn freehand. Um, I don't want it to happen too soon. I want the Karayan 3 to get there first. Okay, now, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. It's kind of glitchy, but I'm seeing 1.5 kilometer closest approach in a little less than four hours. That should work well. The Karayan 3 should be getting there first. I should, close enough that I should be able to work with this. But as if that wasn't enough happening around the moon, well, MapSat9 decided it was time to join the party as well. It has just entered in to the moon's sphere of influence. And I'm just doing a little bit of an adjustment here of my periapsis and inclination, getting it just exactly where I want it to be in order to do my capture. And that capture is going to be in just about two hours. So we got a lot of stuff happening around the moon. But back in low orbit about Kerbin, well, the Karayan 1 is now docking with Kerbin Station. And uh, once it was docked, well, I had to get right back out to the moon to deal with everything that's happening out that way. We still have to get Jeb down to the surface. We still have to prep the Karayan for its next mission. And we got to get ourselves back out to the moon. But all of that is going to have to be for next episode. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.